Good morning, everybody. I'm Stephanie, and this is Brenda. Um, um, and like she just said, we're from the Center for Life Skills here in Solon. Um, it, our office has been open since 2002. We've seen lots and lots of families through all those years. Um, so we're going to give a little slideshow presentation. Um, we'll hold all the questions for later because we'll have plenty of time um, in the breakout sessions to answer questions. Um, so let's see. So I'm, I'm a speech pathologist, and Brenda is an occupational therapist, just so we know. We both work with um, kids who have difficulty feeding because it's within the scope of both of our um, disciplines. Um, I love having a picky eater and making more than one meal at dinner time, said no mom ever. It's true. So the first thing that I just wanted to start by saying is um, everyone has their own perspective. Everyone has their own meal time in their house and their own frustrations with how that might be going. Um, and that's okay. Everyone's, everyone's normal is their normal. Um, so we have an example of a little boy who has autism. Um, well, when we saw him, he was five years old, drinking milk from a cup and like eating Ritz peanut butter crackers. He was a problem feeder. That was, you know, that was going on in their house. We have another patient who is a completely typical eater and then had a stomach virus and was hospitalized for a couple days, came home, would eat nothing at all. So came to our office and we worked with him and after a couple of sessions, he was right back to where he was before. Those are two totally separate kinds of examples, right? One family has a diagnosis of autism and they're going through all these things. They have an IEP at school and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other family is you know, neurotypical, just everything is going as it should and all of a sudden this event happened. Um, it doesn't matter which side we're on, they come to us, you know, we help them. Um, we're the experts in feeding, so we can handle all those different things. Um, but, you know, both houses are having a problem with, with feeding, right? Um, so I just want to make sure that as we're all sitting here and listening together and learning that um, we just remember that what is working in someone's house or what's not working in someone's house may be the same or different in someone else's. Um, so, um, what's picky eating? So picky eating is defined as eating a limited number of foods, avoiding a whole food group, um, and eating different foods than the rest of the family at a meal time. Picky eating can appear within 18 to 24 months of age, and that time it's considered normal. A almost two-year-old is a little picky, just wants noodles all the time, or just you know doesn't want, you know doesn't want the broccoli or whatever, and they tend to be a little bit picky, but they still will eat a variety of things and not cause, um, not cause lots and lots of problems with mealtime. Um, as far as classifications, a severe picky eater, a problem feeder, all those different terms, there's not really an agreed upon system that captures like the complexity of all these different feeding problems. There are families who are children who have complex medical histories. Um, whether they were born premature or they've got some kind of medical diagnosis that leads them to a feeding disorder or a child without any diagnosis at all who has a feeding disorder or someone who's got a developmental disorder like autism or maybe Down syndrome or things like that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about picky eating just in general and then we'll discuss how the severity level can affect our kids in different ways. I don't want to get too much into, well, you're mild and you're moderate and you're severe and that sort of thing. If we're all picky eaters, we're having problems, just like we said, we, we don't want to judge anyone. Well, you're a picky eater, but I'm a problem feeder, so my problems are worse than yours. We just want to talk in general about we're having, I'm having a problem with my three-year-old and I, I need help. Um, so how can picky eating affect the child? Um, so it can decrease your child's attention and energy levels, which can prevent them from being able to explore their environment. If you're not nourished, if you haven't eaten breakfast and all of a sudden you're trying to do all the things on your list for the day, it's going to be hard. Um, it can decrease their cognitive functioning. Kids need nutrients to learn. They need food to learn. Um, it can weaken their immune system, making it harder to fight off illnesses, um, increased risk for weight problems, either underweight or overweight. We've had picky eaters and problem feeders who are very, very underweight because of that, but then we've also had the opposite where they're overweight because cheese doodles and mac and cheese are their staple. Um, uh, dental problems if they're eating too many sweets. Um, 
and also not being able to participate in snack or mealtime um, can affect kids negatively you know in a daycare in a social setting at a birthday party things like that we had a kiddo once who um, the mom uh, just wanted to get him to eat cupcakes because he wouldn't eat cupcakes and I, I don't remember all the other things that he wouldn't eat he wasn't just coming to us for cupcakes there's a lot of other stuff going on but one of her things like what's your top thing was a cupcake because she wanted him to eat the cupcake for his birthday it was a social kind of thing and that was completely valid I mean again it wasn't the only thing we were working on but you know it's his birthday and she wanted him to enjoy it um, how can picky eating affect the family um, picky eating negatively impacts the social well-being of the child and the family as a whole. So, you know, we're frustrated. That's going to affect. It's going to affect how we function as a family. Um, and then I think a big one that we all understand as a parent, one of your primary roles is to provide for your child, and not being able to do that really stinks. It's really hard. You're, you know, we were just talking about before. You make food and you want to give it to your child, and they just say no. <laughs> and you, you know, you just want to nourish them. You want them to enjoy it, and that's really hard. Um, Increased stress around mealtimes can lead to conflict in relationships. It can, you know, um, parents can argue about how to deal with those things, um, and that's, that's difficult too. Um, picky eating can lead to refusal of foods and negative behaviors from the child, so then you have the, all these behavior issues that are around food that might translate into other areas um, of development. So um, those are just some of the ways that, that it can affect the family. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we start to decide when you need some help with picky eating? Um, first, when mealtime becomes frustrating on a daily basis where, you know, it's 4.30 and you know dinner time is coming and the whole family is dreading it, um, that whole witching hour. Um, when the child is really anxious or fearful about food, that's a, a red flag for really needing some, some help. Um, some sources say, you know, a certain number of food, whether it's 12 foods or 20 foods, you know, depending on the source. If they're eating fewer than those numbers of foods, um, it might be a good time to be looking for additional help. And then also when the weight and nutrition is compromised, it's a, um, a red flag for um, needing a little, some intervention. So what are some issues that can contribute to picky foods? Now this, of course, is not all-encompassing, but um, these are some of the big ones we can uh, talk about. Medical issues like acid reflux, um, other gastrointestinal disorders, um, oral motor issues, trouble with chewing or swallowing, with moving food around in the mouth, um, those kinds of things. Sensory processing issues, um, so issues with textures or temperatures, um, some even it's just the, the color, um, gagging, vomiting. Um, Severe rigid thinking. Um, there was one little guy with autism that Stephanie mentioned earlier that was only drinking milk and eating Ritz crackers. He had very strict rules in his mind about what he would eat or where he would eat it. When he started to learn to eat foods with us, he knew or in his mind he could only do it with us, not any other place. So those are the rigid thinking things that we can help get past also. Um, and behavior or anxiety issues. So why speech therapy or occupational therapy? What can we do to help? Um, we're really trained in working with young children. Um, we're trained in typical development and then also you know, those bumps in the road in typical development. Um, we have training in the way the sensory systems work um, and how the motor planning and development of chewing and swallowing all plays a part in eating. Um, and then also we have expertise in behavioral techniques um, and that can play a part you know, sometimes it's what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Is there a behavioral issue or an eating issue? And then it, you know, just becomes this big confusion. What's, what's really the, te the root of the problem there? So what do feeding therapy sessions look like? Um, of course, this is going to be different for every child. Um, there, there is no cookbook for feeding therapy, like do this and do this and do this. Um, but these are some of the things that we do. Um, exposure to new foods in different ways that aren't quite as um, threatening. So we're not expecting them to eat right away. Maybe we're going to work on smelling or touching um, or just tasting but not eating. Um, feeding new or non-preferred foods to other people. So having your child feed you or feed a guinea pig a carrot or feed something to the dog 
we've had a lot of success with those kinds of things too, just letting the child handle the food and be near it without the expectation that they have to eat it themselves. Um, having a child help you prepare food, doing cooking, um, growing or harvesting food. We have a little garden in, in our office um, and people can do that at home too as the child watches things grow and helps take care of the plants and it just makes it, they think about it in a different way then. Um, behavior modification, oral motor exercises, um, exposure to positive modeling, so a lot of um, hoorays and a lot of happy affect around food. Um, intake modification, so a lot of times instead of putting a whole spoonful of corn on the plate, we'll maybe put two corn kernels and start very small and it is just less overwhelming at that point parent education, and then we also do home-based program and development. So some general recommendations for home. First, provide consistent, positive, encouraging environment. We try to do or suggest low stimulating environments during feeding, so um, fewer screens, that's really hard sometimes, no TV, no phones, iPads, whatever, um, but also having a meals at the same time, kind of the same setting at the table if possible. I know those things are often hard. Um, we really suggest if you're working on new foods to not do that at mealtime, um, to make mealtime more of a comfortable time and do new foods, suggest new foods, try new foods at a separate time, maybe if it's a snack time or we call it something different like a food science time or whatever so that it's not given that expectation of, oh no, it's dinner time, our stressful time, and here comes all this new food. Um, and then also a shared family meal time with minimal distractions we think is really helpful. Um, another general recommendation that we often make is to emphasize the attributes of the food, not only asking do you like it, um, because we found often if you offer a new food and they try it and you say, do you like it? And they say no, well then you're kind of stuck. So we suggest talking about other things. Is it hot or is it cold? Is it crunchy? Is it soft? It's, it's a red strawberry, not a purple grape or whatever. Just talking about all those different attributes and leaving the like and don't like out of it completely. Um, we find that that can really help children reframe the way they think about food. Um, we suggest avoid, avoiding using preferred foods as a reward. So take three bites of this new food and you can have M&Ms, um, I think often can create more of a power struggle. Um, expand expectations at mealtime slowly um, and with the guidance of a therapist or you know, whoever you might be working with on that kind of thing. Um, limiting snack. Um, we find a lot of kids graze all day and eat a little bit all day and they're really not hungry at mealtime then. Um, so limiting snacks to specific times can help them start to feel hunger um, and then usually mealtime is a little more successful because they're, they're knowing that they need something at that point. Um, and keep trying. It's, it's one thing that we say about feeding therapy is it's never a quick easy fix. It takes time. Um, these are patterns and behaviors that have built up over time. Um, and to change those, it, it does take some time. Um, these are a couple of the books that we use at the office that we really love. Um, and I know there are other resources. So all these recommendations that um, Brenda was just talking about, those are, they're mostly for your picky eaters. So if, you know, if you've got kids who are not picky eaters, it's okay to offer a new food at a meal time. I just want to make that clear, like that's a fine thing to do unless you know, we're having a hard time, I and mean, our topic is picky eaters, so that's why those are there. But I just wanted to clarify that. If you're, if you're a parent and you've been offering new foods at mealtime, it's going great, perfect. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just for those picky eaters where it's a battle that we want to make all those suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so these are um, some game boards that Emily, one of our therapists, made, and we use them during our feeding sessions. So um, this one is um, Paw Patrol because it's all fun. So um, there's, you know, the characters, and then there's the star. So you, on the back, there's um, 
uh, like the little game movers, and you can use a dice or a die, um, and move forward. And then when you land on the star, you take a bite of the, whatever your new food is, the food that you're working on, and then whatever you land on, you can take a bite of your preferred food um, or the food you're working on and get all the way around to the end. Sure. Um, so these are some examples of how to make it positive and make it a little different than we're sitting down at the table and it's time to eat food. You know, so just to change kind of the, the general affect around meal time, food time kind of thing. Um, another thing that I often use is a simple game like, sorry, like Connect Four um, and not use it the typical way where we are trying to get four in a row. But child takes a bite and they get one of the, the chips and they get to put it in and they know oh, after we do two rows, we're done with trying this new food. So it just gives a very clear beginning and end, not putting a whole plate of, a whole scoop of corn on their plate, but they know, okay, I'm gonna do 12 bites or 12 tastes or 12 whatever, and then it's over. Um, I have a little guy that I've been doing feeding with for quite a while, and he is driven to, to win games. So after he has his bite of, we're on, he's doing, he's great in all kinds of foods now, but I'll give him a, I don't know, bite of banana, and then I hide the chips in my hand, and he gets to guess, is it in this hand or this hand? And I know that he always picks this hand every time, and he <laughs> wins, and then he's ready for the next piece because he won, and he's happy, and he's excited. So I hide the next chip, and he guesses this hand, and he's happy as can be eating bananas, even though he told me before that he hates bananas. But he's driven to be successful and win at something, and I don't care if I lose at Connect Four. And he guessed, <laughs> and he guessed the chip. I mean, he was great at this game because he, he kept guessing the chip over and over. So he has this like positive experience. Um, I'll just share another story that I was talking about. That little boy who um, had the illness and was hospitalized and then wouldn't eat anything. And it's understandable, right? Psychologically, well, I ate and. I threw up and I went to the hospital, so I'm not going to eat anymore. I mean, I can't. So I think, I forget now, it was a while ago, I think he was just drinking, like, some smoothies or something. I'm like, okay, well, what can I start with? Like, I'm probably not going to start with chicken or, like, you know, uh, meat or whatever. Let's do chocolate chips. So I got a bag of chocolate chips, and we started just by licking it. And I said, I wonder if your tooth could just, like, crush it just a little bit, but don't eat it. And then he did that, and then after, we would run, like, loud and fast out of the kitchen down the hall not such a big hall down the hall into the room with the swing go in the swing you know circle around and then run back to the kitchen and like the whole office <laughs> knew what was going on because we were loud and we were screaming with delight and we come back and then another chocolate chip and literally we probably did like two sessions of a chocolate chip and then at home he started um, eating some other foods and then boom he was off to back where he was because but he was also old enough that he could understand so you know you were sick but you're not always going to get sick from food so you ate this so you're good you know it was a little bit easier than someone with maybe some other diagnoses going on mm -hmm. um, but just making it fun and I've also done um, a high five and it knocks me off the chair really cheap you don't have to buy it anywhere just a high five and then when when they hit your hand you like almost fall down I mean Kids like anything, right? They like a box instead of a big toy. They like a high five instead of other stuff sometimes. So it's just, it's hard to do that when you're a parent at home because I'm a parent at home and if you were telling me all these things like I have like two other kids and someone wants a drink and I've got the broccoli that's burning, I can't also do a high five. But if you can somehow work work that in, um, it, might, it might change. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So thinking about the, the connect four game or the high five, every child's motivation is different. Um, so we found really good success in looking for that one thing that the child is really interested in and using that to build food. So that sounds like, sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Um, but sometimes it's hard to find those things and to tweak it to, to use it to our advantage. So another example is the boy that she was talking about earlier that drank milk, or he had a diagnosis of autism, drank milk and Ritz Fritz crackers, and that was his entire diet. Well, this little guy <coughs> loved the Pixar logo. That was his area of fascination. So every Pixar logo, he would draw it and he would write it, and so we made cards for th with those letters, P-I-X-A-R. Oh, yeah, we still have our Pixar cards. And we would 
after one bite, he would get the P card. Well, we knew at that point that he wouldn't stop because he had to have the whole word because he loved that word Pixar. So who would think that Pixar would be a motivator for learning to eat chicken nuggets? Um, but it worked really, really great for that little guy. And right. Well, and we, we used that like rigidity, hyperlexia, he could already, already read that sometimes goes with autism and we use that to our advantage with him. And you know, like Brenda said, that, that worked for him because he couldn't just have the PIX. Some other kids, like whatever, I don't care about your word, but he couldn't, he couldn't take that. He also couldn't handle us, he would eat a whole red apple, but only if it was whole. Like once you take a bite out of it, it's not whole anymore. Um, it doesn't taste much different if you cut it and you take a bite with the peel, right? But he, but he just couldn't do it. So we would start by practicing just cutting the apple and having him like look and see that we were cutting the apple. And then from there we were able to cut the apple without him like turning away and then take a bite of the apple. And it was, you know, very slow going, but little by little he went from eating, you know, milk in a bottle and Ritz Bits crackers. So the peanut butter in the Ritz Bits cracker was the only source of protein pretty much, which is not the greatest protein ever. And then we got him to eat a peanut butter sandwich because we took that peanut, the peanut butter from the Ritz and we were able to get him to do that and eat slices of a red delicious apple that we had cut and chicken nuggets we, we right. got to. And the, the um, whole apple thing was a really long process where the three of us would be sitting at the table together and he would have to pass. I would say, Stephanie, can I have a slice of the apple? And he would, oh, Jack, you know, can I have a piece of the apple? Because you know, Brenda it wants to it. Thank so you. It wasn't, it wasn't that he had the expectation of eating it. He was just passing it to me, and I was going to eat it. Um, so again, just getting him familiar with it and letting him explore it without that pressure that, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to eat the slice of the apple that I already eat. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that often these things are much easier in our office with us than they are at home with mom, okay. dad, grandma, caregiver. It's just the way it goes. I mean, with other therapy too, um, kids sometimes don't perform well when their parent is there because they can run to their parent to save them, right? But with us, the parent's not there, and they kind of have to do what, we, what we're doing or what we say, even though it's all fun. Um, so sometimes these techniques are might work in our office, but not so much at home because it's just a different environment. So um, that's just something to take into consideration. But it's certainly worth trying all those things. Yeah, we find often that. We'll work on the feeding for a little while with the parent out of the room so that the expectation is just different, and then bring the parent into the room after several sessions so that the child learns that they can actually eat the goldfish cracker with the mom in the room so that they can also eat it at home and they can also eat it at school, you know, and so they can generalize those things. Because for some of those kids with rigid thinking, think, okay, well, I'll do it with Brenda or with Stephanie or at this table, but not, you know, anywhere else. So that um, is one way can, we can help to kind of generalize that. 